Good morning and welcome to this online service of St Peter's Church in Fulham. My name is David Lee, I'm the Associate Vicar at St Peter's and it's great to be with you this morning. Now of course online church it's not as good as meeting in person but it's a good second best for this strange season we're in. And one of the upsides of doing church in this way is that I know a number of people who haven't joined us on a Sunday at St Peter's have been able to join us online. And you're really welcome if that's you. We are really enjoying being able to reach out and connect with you. We love to see you face to face when we're able to meet once again in our church building or indeed before then in our virtual coffee time after the service this morning. Uh, details of how to do that will explain a bit later. It would be great to see you, to be able to uh, meet you personally. That would be a really good thing to do. Well, I don't know how you are uh, feeling at the moment. I know many are getting weary uh, with lockdown, longing for it to be over, to be able to get out and about uh, again. Um, I know some are struggling and finding this season a really increasingly difficult one. And so if that's you, I wanted you to hear these words from Isaiah chapter 40 at the start of our time together this morning. Let me read them to you and then I'll lead us in a prayer. Isaiah writes, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Let's pray together. Lord, you are the everlasting God. You created the ends of the earth, and so there is nothing outside your control. Lord, you know us, and you know we come to you in different places this morning. Different places spiritually, emotionally, and physically. You know that some of us are feeling tired and weary. And so that we ask that you would meet us in our troubles, visit us in our weakness, and this morning encourage us with the hope we can have in Christ and help us to trust him completely. And we ask this in his name. Amen. One of the great promises of the Bible for those who are feeling weak and weary and yet trusting in the Lord is that he is their fortress and we're going to sing of that now I'm going to hand over to David Tubbs our music minister and the music team we're going to sing together consuming fire a burning holy flame with glory and freedom our God is the only righteous judge ruling over us with kindness and wisdom and we will keep our eyes on you we will keep our eyes Fortress is our God, a sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable, with you forever we will reign. Our God is jealous for his own. None could his love and His mercy. Our God is exalted on His throne, high above the heavens, forever He's worthy. We will keep our eyes. 
set our hearts on you. Lord, we set our hearts on you. A mighty fortress is our God.
my hideaway. David, thank you very much for teaching us that new song. What great news that Christ will be, is our hideaway. And when you know uh, Jesus like that, when you trust in God, you know him to be your strength and you know him to be with us, prayer is a really obvious and natural thing to do. Of course you'll want to speak to the one who is with you and who can make a difference. And that's what we're going to spend some time doing right now. We're going to do it in a slightly different way to the way we've done it over the past few weeks here at St Peter's. We've asked Steve and Anna Griffiths, some of our mission partners, to share what's happening in their lives and how we can pray for them. Uh, Steve and Anna, if you don't know them, are involved with the mission organisation OMF, mobilising Brazilian Christians to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those living in East Asia. The way we're going to do this is we'll watch the video and then I'd invite you in your homes where you are, whether that's on your own or with your family, uh, to spend some time praying for Steve and Anna, for their family and for their ministry. Uh, we'll have some music on in the background quietly just while you do that and after a few minutes I'll call us back together and we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. But first let's hear from Steve and Anna. Hello everyone at St Peter's Fulham. This is uh, Steve and Anna Griffiths Morning. and um, it's great. We've got the opportunity to send a short video um, to help you know how to pray for us. Mm -hmm. um, you might guess from the surroundings or you might not, but we are not in Brazil where we normally are. At the moment we are in Oakham in Rutland. Um, we're here living with my parents who are both in their 80s. Um, as, as things start in started to worsen uh, with COVID-19 and uh, my sister who usually cares for my parents, um, her MS worsened, we realised we needed to be over here. So we've been over in the UK now uh, for more than a month, living with and caring for my parents. Um, so, but we still need your prayers very, very much as a family. Um, we'd love your prayers for for our children as well. Uh, our son Joshua is an NHS doctor working in Macclesfield in the, in the thick of the battle against uh, COVID-19. Uh, our daughter-in-law Rachel is a social worker in Manchester dealing with some very uh, challenging and uh, situations, disadvantages, families and so on. And our our daughter, Amy, uh, her medical school has closed down. Uh, she's retrained as a healthcare assistant and is also um, working at, the, at a supermarket, um, uh, wanting to play her part too. Uh, so we'd, we'd really covet your prayers for, for our precious children at this time. Yeah, I think particularly that they would bring hope to those they care mm. for and interact with and courage to their colleagues at this time. Um, in between um, keeping the show on the road for my parents, we are carrying on with our work and of course uh, as everybody is working at home um, and using the internet or the whole time, having Zoom meetings with mission partners, um, partner agencies in Brazil, connecting with our missionaries on the field, um, encouraging those who are waiting to go to, to Asia with OMF. They're back in Brazil just wondering when, when will the Lord open the door. Um, and I, I think in all of this, um, we need the Lord's wisdom to balance our time 
Um, we want to be an encouragement to those we connect with. Mm. Um, but also we need wisdom to know how to respond to some of their requests um, and the challenges that they're facing. And we'd love uh, your prayers for the situation that's being faced by um, uh, missionaries or cross-cultural workers uh, from Latin America uh, in East Asia uh, right now. Um, one of the biggest challenges, for example, for our Brazilian missionaries is the fact that the Brazilian economy is very closely tied to the Chinese economy. So right from the beginning of the year, uh, the Brazilian economy was damaged because of what was going on in China. That has caused a massive devaluation of the, the Rio. Uh, the Brazilian currency. So even though churches in Brazil are still giving sacrificially to support uh, workers on the field, uh, that the value of the real has fallen by 25%. So keeping up their offerings, but seeing the value of those offerings decrease significantly, we please turn with us to the Lord and uh, pray with us that the Lord would provide what is needed to keep those missionaries serving on the field. And one of the challenges, of course, is that their supporters are still giving. Uh, it's not that their supporters have stopped, but as Steve said, the value of those gifts is less. And so as, as an organisation, OMF needs wisdom to know how we can help our needy members. And I know you prayed for us at the beginning of the year. We had a huge, we went to a huge mobilisation event in Chile, in Santiago, uh, in February. And we interacted with um, thousands of people at this conference. And, and had over 100 people actually come and register with OMF at, at our booth saying they wanted to find out more. And right now we're following up with those people, not us alone. Um, we've got a group of volunteers who are doing this with us. Unfortunately, all the others speak Spanish. Um, so can you pray that we do keep up with them, that we're diligent in, in responding to them and their requests. Some want to do short-term trips, some want to pray, some want to help us translate materials. So we're really, really grateful for the contact we're having, um, but we need strength to keep up with that and, and just not to let anything fall between the cracks. Um, one person wrote to me yesterday and she said, I was supposed to go on a trip to Thailand and Taiwan and Myanmar this summer with my husband and, it, and it's been cancelled. It wasn't with OMF. She said, I was looking online and I found the OMF website and I'm excited. I think God maybe have, has delayed my our trip so that I can engage more with OMF. It's little things like that that encourage us. But pray for those inquirers that came to our booth in Chile. Um, why are we doing all this? Why are we carrying on? Because people in East Asia are largely unreached by the gospel. They need the Lord. They need the Lord more than ever at the moment with this pandemic going on. Um, so the love of Christ compels us. We have the hope of the risen Lord, don't we? And the good news of Jesus to share. And we long for that good news to reach the people of East Asia. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you. God bless you. Bye. <laughs>
Let me give you a few moments to draw your prayers to a close. And we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together, the words of which are coming up on the screen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, this morning we're continuing the series we started last week, looking at the New Testament book of Revelation. In just a moment, Rupert Standring, our vicar here at St Peter's, will be taking us through the second half of chapter one. But before he does that, Philstein has our reading for us. Morning, everybody. Today's reading comes from Revelation chapter one verses 9 to 20. John's vision of Christ. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash round his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were blazing like fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive for ever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. 
Last week, if you were able to join us, we started a new series, both here on Sundays and in our midweek virtual home groups in the New Testament book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. If you missed that and uh, you want to catch up, that talk is available online on our Facebook page and uh, on our YouTube channel, as is a really helpful overview of Revelation that uh, Simon Pedley from our church plants at Michael's Fullwell did for us just yesterday. Do have a look at that as well. It's really clear and accessible and will help you get the most out of our time together in this strange and somewhat unusual book of the Bible. Last week in the first half of chapter one, John answered the question for us, what kind of book is Revelation? And he answered it with eight different answers to that question. Some of us found that a little bit mesmerizing and overwhelming. So we landed at the end of last week on one very simple answer to that question. The book of Revelation is a book all about Jesus. And that's what John gives us today in the second half of chapter one. His very first vision of many that he's given by Jesus is actually a vision of Jesus. After last week's eight points, uh, I vowed not to give you an eight point sermon this week and I'm glad to say I'm going to be able to fulfill that vow but unfortunately that's by giving you a nine point sermon which isn't what you wanted to hear but don't blame me blame John or rather blame Jesus which of course doesn't sound quite right does it Jesus told John to write down what he saw and what he saw was nine things Jesus wants us to know about him. As Christians, we believe in him, even though we can't see him. So he showed himself to John so that John could see him. And he told John to write down what he saw for our benefit, to strengthen our faith in him. But before we get into those nine things, John gives us in verses 9 to 11 of chapter 1, a bit of context as to how and where and why he was given this vision. So let me look at that with just five quick questions. The first is, who? Who is John? Have a look back at verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. To what he said about himself in uh, Verse four, which was just his name, John, he adds that he's a a brother in Christ to these Christians he's writing to, that he's a companion with them, both in suffering for being Christian and in belonging to God's kingdom and in the patient endurance, that is keeping on having Jesus as your king despite suffering for it. And all of that, verse nine, if you look, is ours in Jesus. There's the package, there's what you get if you become a Christian. Who knew? Well, that's the who, then the where. Where did this uh, vision of Jesus take place? Verse nine, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The island of Patmos, Uh, when some of you may have uh, been on holiday, is just 40 miles off the coast of Western Turkey. I don't know if you can see that in uh, a map that's popped up on the screen. Western Turkey was where his readers lived in uh, seven different cities. Their cities are also marked on the map too. Why was he there? Well, he says, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus which either means that uh, John was on the island of Patmos because he'd been banished there for preaching the gospel on the mainland where his readers lived in their churches, or because he'd been sent to Patmos from those churches to take the gospel there. When did he receive this uh, this vision? Verse 10, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, he says, and heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. The Lord's Day here refers to uh, 
Sunday, the first day of the week. And in the spirit, uh, either means that simply that John was uh, at church, worshipping God in spirit and in truth, which as Jesus says in John's gospel is the only way to worship God, or that John was in some sort of heightened state of spiritual awareness. What happened? What happened? Well, first he says he heard something. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said to me, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. That's where um, his readers live. I don't know if you can see that uh, on the map again in those seven churches in Western Turkey. First of all, he heard something, some instructions to write down what he saw. And then he says he saw something. Verse 12, I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And of course, uh, you can't see a voice. So what he actually saw was the owner of that voice. What he did was write down what he saw. He obeyed his instructions. And what he wrote down was the nine things about Jesus that Jesus wants us to know, us who can't see him, to know about him. And the first is this. Jesus is with his people. Jesus is with his people. Have a look uh, again at verse 12. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Now verse 20 that comes at the very end of our reading very helpfully tells us that the seven lampstands represent the seven churches that John is writing to. There's the uh, number seven again. And in the book of Revelation, as we were thinking last week, the number seven represents completeness. So the seven churches represent the whole church in every age, everywhere in the world. And they're pictured as lampstands here because that is the job of the church in every age, everywhere in the world, to hold up and to hold out the light of Jesus to the world, to shine brightly and compellingly to draw people to Jesus. And Jesus, <clears throat> who is here described as someone like a son of man, how he often refers to himself in the Gospels, you see is right in the middle, in amongst the lampstands. We can't see him, though we believe in him and follow him. But he wants us to know that he is nevertheless right here with us, that he hasn't abandoned us and gone back to heaven and left us on our own that by his spirit, the reality is he is with us. If in these challenging times of social isolation, you feel particularly alone and distant, not just from other people, but actually increasingly as weeks go by from God, here is the reality that you can't see, but Jesus wants you to know because he knows it will help. He is with us in this season of coronavirus. That's the first thing. <clears throat> the second thing he wants us to know is that he is at work among his people. He's not just with us to reassure us, he is busy doing stuff to us. Have a look at verse 13. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet. And with a gold sash, around his chest. The picture we've got here is, is of a priest in the temple tending the lampstands, perhaps tending the, the seven branched lampstand that stood in the temple, trimming the wicks, changing the oil, relighting the ones that have gone out. That's the work that Jesus is doing right now. He's not absent from his church or idle in his church. He is right here in the middle of us all by his spirit, tending us, looking after us, relighting those of us who have gone out or gone uh, dim just at the moment. And he wants us to know that this is the work he is doing in us if we need him to. This is the work he can do in us 
if we ask him to. So if you need some tending, some relighting, some trimming, if you've noticed that your patience with others is shorter, or your faith in Jesus is duller, or your witness to him is fainter in recent weeks, ask him to be busy, to be at work in you. This is the work he's doing now. Thirdly, he wants us to know he is to be identified as God himself. Look at verse 14. <clears throat> the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. Now this is not a literal description of Jesus' uh, physical appearance. It is symbolic of his character. His hair is described as being white like wool, as white as snow, not because he's really aged in heaven or because actually, what do you know? He looks a lot like Father Christmas, but because he is to be identified as God himself. Do you remember from last week, there's uh, lots of the Old Testament in the book of Revelation and in the Old Testament book of Daniel, from which uh, many of the images in this vision are taken. Daniel, you know, the one from the lion's den, he also had a vision and about what he saw, he writes this, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days, that's Daniel's title for God, took his seat. His clothing was, like, was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. The Jesus that we as Christians follow is none other than God himself. And he wants us to know that about him. He's not just someone like a son of man, though Jesus was fully human as well. He is fully divine and he reveals himself to John in a way that makes that unmistakable. Fourthly, because of that, because he is divine, he can see us as we really are. He can see us <clears throat> as we really are. End of verse 14. His eyes were like blazing fire. This is not exactly gentle Jesus, meek and mild, or away in a manger, no crying, he made theology. The blazing eyes of Jesus are to indicate to us that he sees us as we really are. Warts and all, sin and all, failure and all. He can see through our facades and our pretense and our best versions of ourselves that we try and present to the world that sometimes we fool the world with. He sees through all of that. He sees into our very souls. And as we'll see from what he says to John at the end of this vision, he still loves us. He doesn't feel conned that he's ended up with us as his followers or us in his church. Remember, it, he chose us, not the other way around. And he did that knowing full well what we are like because he can see us as we really are. Once you get over the somewhat intimidating aspect of that, the blazing eyes of Jesus are actually very reassuring. He sees us as we are and he still chose us. Fifth, his kingdom that we belong to is strong and secure and tested because he is strong and secure and tested. Have a look at verse 15. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, refined and purified and strengthened by the fire. Again, in the Old Testament book of Daniel, Daniel had another vision where a huge statue was set up that had different parts of its body made of different materials. And the feet of that statue, we're told, were made partly of iron and partly of clay. As a result of that, when a huge rock hit the statue's feet. It smashed them and the whole statue came crashing down, was broken into pieces and swept away by the wind. In the vision, Daniel is told that the different parts of the statue represent different kingdoms. The kingdom represented by the feet of iron and clay is a kingdom that is weak and divided and so insecure. By contrast, what we have here in this vision of Jesus that John is given, Jesus has feet like bronze, 
glowing in the furnace. Not only are they made of a single strong material, but that material has been refined and purified and strengthened in a furnace. What Jesus wants us to know about him is that he has been through the fiery furnace of death and come through the other side, through resurrection to live forever. He is strong and secure and tested. He's not going anywhere, which means the kingdom that he has established and made us a part of through his death is also, like its king, strong and secure and tested. It's not going anywhere. Nothing can bring it crashing down. Nothing can break it into pieces or sweep it away. Not even death itself. Isn't that something that's good to hear in these days when death is all around us? If we belong to this king's kingdom, we too will be strong and secure in his kingdom because of him. We can't see that at the moment. We might not even be able to feel that this week. But this is the unseen reality he wants us to know. Six, the sixth thing Jesus wants us to know about him <clears throat> is that he speaks with the voice of God. End of verse 15 we read, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. At the beginning of the book, uh, Old Testament book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel the prophet also had a vision. He saw four living creatures beneath God's throne. They too interestingly, come out of a furnace and have feet like bronze. And about them he writes this, When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty. The voice of Jesus, like the sound of rushing waters, is the voice of the Almighty, the voice of God. Which means not only should we listen to him, it also means that if we want to hear the voice of God, we need to listen to Jesus. We won't hear God's voice anywhere else, from anyone else. So let's get our Bibles open, shall we? We've got the time, after all, at the moment. And as we read them, all of them, let's hear and listen to and obey the voice of Jesus. Seven, Jesus holds those who belong to him safely in his hand. Verse 16. In his right hand he held seven stars. That number seven again and again in verse 20 we find out what these seven stars are. Although to be honest the, the explanation there is not much help. Verse 20 if you look, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw, Jesus says to John, in my right hand and of the seven lampstands is this, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. If you look, if you have your Bibles open just across the page, the letters of the seven churches in chapters two and three, you can see that each one is not addressed directly to the church in each place, but somewhat unusually for a letter, to the angel of each church. Now, without getting either bogged down by this strange idea or swept away by the sentimental notion that each and every church has its very own guardian angel, that St Peter's Fulham has its very own guardian angel. But again, if we take our cue from the Old Testament and again from the book of Daniel, it does seem as you look there that in some sense, things and uh, entities on earth are represented in some way by angels in heaven. Strange though that sounds. Things on earth have a heavenly parallel. So when Jesus says he's got the seven stars in his right hand, by which he means the, the seven angels of the seven churches, by which we're to understand the, the heavenly representatives of those seven earthly churches. What Jesus is saying is that he's got all the churches in every age, in every part of the world. He's got everyone who belongs to him safely in his hand. So however unsafe you feel at the moment on earth during corona crisis, however unsafe you might be feeling at the moment during lockdown, maybe with fears 
that maybe no one else knows anything of. If you belong to Jesus, spiritually speaking, you could not be anywhere safer. But having said that, eight, his words cut both ways. Verse 16, out of his mouth, coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. As we begun to see already in our home group studies, in what he says to the seven churches in chapters two and three, Jesus speaks to them both words of comfort and words of challenge. He speaks words that expose their sin and failure and shame, but also words that encourage them and reassure them and build them up. If you've been a Christian any length of time at all, then you will know this about Jesus. His words can cut you to the heart and lay you bare. And his words can bind up your broken heart and wrap you in his love. His words cut both ways because they're words of truth. Ninth, last thing Jesus wants us to know about himself. End of verse 16. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Jesus radiates God's glory. Another writer in the New Testament, the author to the letter to the Hebrews, says exactly the same thing, but puts it in a different way. He writes this, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. If you want to hear God, Jesus says, listen to me. I have the voice of God. If you want to see God, Jesus says, look at me. I radiate his glory. And what is John's response to seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus? This overwhelming vision of what Jesus is like. What's his response? Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. John's response is both understandable and it would seem to us to be entirely appropriate, confronted with such majesty and glory, but not according to Jesus it's not. Have a look at what Jesus says and does. Verse 17, then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And then he gives John three reasons for him not to be afraid. Verse 17, I am the first and the last. It's a different way of saying what he said last week. I am the alpha and the omega. I am the A to Z God. I was there at the beginning. I'll be there at the end. I've got this. So don't be afraid. Second reason, verse 18. I am the living one. I was dead and now I am, look, I am alive forever and ever. I am, in other words, indestructible, unending, eternal. And you belong to me. I share all of this with you. So don't be afraid. Third reason, verse 18. I hold the keys of death and Hades, which is the, the place of the dead. I'm both the judge, Jesus says, and the jailer. I'm the one who decides where every soul will spend all of eternity. And I'm the one who will keep them there. So do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of me. Do not be afraid of anything else because of me. Do not be afraid because you belong to me. This Jesus that John sees, who, who shows himself to John, is the Jesus that we know and worship and belong to. It isn't a vision of what he looks like, it's a vision of what he is like. And he, he showed himself to John in this way because he wants us to know what he's like. And aren't you glad that he did? To know all of this about Jesus, these nine things about him, but perhaps especially at the moment, in this season in which we're living, to know he is the first and the last, the A to Z God. He is the living one, now indestructibly alive. 
He is the holder of the keys of death in control of our last enemy. Knowing Jesus is like this, how safe do you feel? Well, let's take a moment to reflect on our glorious, risen, majestic Saviour and our lead us in a prayer. Let's pray. John writes, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. Lord Jesus, this vision that you give us of yourself through John is truly both overwhelming and uh, terrifying and yet at the same time wonderfully reassuring and comforting that this vision of you uh, cuts both ways. It brings us up short as we recognise our sinfulness before you and yet it reminds us of, of your grace and your mercy to us, that knowing what we are like, you still want us, you still have us for yourself because you have cleansed us through your blood. You have made us for yourself, a kingdom and priests who will belong to you forever. We pray that this glorious vision of how you are, or who you are, would enable us to continue to put our trust in you to patiently endure uh, now and to look forward to being with you forever. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
myself is no other name but Jesus, Jesus, my hope in darkest night, my broken soul's delight, no other name but Jesus, Jesus, my joy in sorrow's tears, my strength to cast out fears, no other name but Jesus, Jesus. Trust in life, no other name but Jesus, Jesus. Last week, I gave you an update on our finances as a church as coronavirus has had a big impact on them. And this week, I just wanted to briefly update you on our current financial situation. Due to coronavirus, we've lost £42,000 of expected income for this year. But we've also been able to reduce our overall expenditure by the same amount. What that means is that we've been able to keep our projected deficit for this year down to the same amount that we had budgeted for, £23,000. Since I announced that figure uh, just the other week, there's been a, a tremendous response and I'm really glad to be able to announce that as of today, that deficit is now down to £8,000, which is absolutely fantastic. If you are a regular member of St Peter's and you have yet to respond to this urgent financial appeal, please can I ask you to consider doing so this week. Please can you review your uh, giving and either increase your monthly automated giving or make a, a one-off gift to reduce this deficit. Details of how to do that, if you're not sure, can be found in the recent newsletter. Not everyone will be able to respond by increasing their giving due to the financial pressures that we're all under. And if that is you, then please don't. Indeed, if you yourself need financial help, please would you let us know. We have a small fund in the budget for this year for just such a need and we'd be very glad to help you if you need that sort of help. If you're new to St Peter's and have just found us uh, online and would like to make a contribution to keep us online, then you'll either find a link in the description below if you're watching on Facebook or on the screen now and uh, after the service has ended if you're watching on YouTube. If you click on that link or copy and paste that, um, you'll, that'll take you to our web page and details of uh, how to make a uh, payment to St Peter's can be found there. Raising a further £8,000 will eliminate our deficit for 2020. But then after that, any money that is given will be used to pay some of the costs that we have had to cut or postpone. That in reality, we do need to pay and really should be paying this year. Thank you so much to everyone who has responded to this financial request so far. Please continue to join with me in praying for us that we would be able to trust God as a church with our finances and as individuals and so we would be enabled to be uh, generous with the financial resources that he's given to each of us. Thank you. We're nearly at the end of this part of our time together. Uh, thank you again for being with us. As I said at the start, if you're able to join us for our virtual coffee time conducted over Zoom in about five minutes time, uh, we would really welcome you there. We'd love to say hello if you've started tuning into St Peter's since we've had to move online or if you're part of our church family, it's a great opportunity to catch up uh, with people maybe you haven't had a chance to connect with during the week. 
Here at St Peter's we are trying to do online church better and better as the week goes on and we'd love your help with that. So if you have any comments or suggestions about how we could improve things, please do send us an email to feedback at stpetersfulham.co.uk. Uh, we'd really appreciate your help. Before I close in a prayer, let me just run for you a, through no, a few notices. If you were able to join us with Simon Pedley uh, with, uh, for an overview of the book of Revelation yesterday morning, you'll know that we had a great time doing that, a really helpful bird's eye view of this book of the Bible. We're spending some time in this term. If you weren't able to join us, and we know that Saturday mornings don't work for everyone, the good news is we were able to record that session. And when we've just tidied it up a bit, that will be going uh, online. So please do look out for that. The next thing to say is this coming Thursday evening, we have an online version of our Table Talk event. It's a chance to have a think over a drink, normally in the Whitehorse pub, uh, but this coming Thursday over Zoom. And we're going to be hearing from two of the doctors from St Peter's who are on the front line in the battle against coronavirus. They're going to be sharing what the experience has been like for them, as well as the difference that their faith has made as they've gone about doing that. Again, the details for that are in the description for this video. Uh, do come along to hear from Mark and from Sue Lee. And if you have uh, friends who would be interested, why not invite them along to the Zoom call? We're hoping to be able to have some discussion times in breakout rooms. Uh, we'll be able to pair you up with your friends and you can uh, speak to them, chat to them about what they thought of that. Then the following week, uh, starting on Wednesday the 13th of May, we're running an online Christianity Explored course. Whether you yourself have uh, started thinking about Christian things as a result of coronavirus or whether uh, you have a friend who's been asking you some questions, this would be a great opportunity to spend some time investigating the Christian faith through uh, Mark's Gospel. Uh, we'll take uh, we'll do it over six Wednesday evenings. Um, there's a bit of video input, a bit of discussion time, chance to ask any questions you have. It's a great low key way of finding out more about Jesus, more about the Christian faith. Again, details of how to sign up for that are in the description for this. Uh, the easiest way of doing it is by emailing ce at stpetersfulham.co.uk. And again, we can fill you in on more of the details. There are lots of other things going on uh, here at St. Peter's. Probably the easiest way for you to find out about them is to sign up to our weekly e-newsletter. Again, details of how to do that are in the description for this video. Well, I'm going to stop there. Please do join us in a few minutes for our Zoom virtual coffee time. But before we enjoy that, uh, let me lead us in a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, the living one who was dead and now is alive forever and ever. Thank you that he holds the keys of death and Hades. And we want to praise you for your son, Jesus Christ, because as we were just singing a moment ago, there is no one else who can redeem us, no one else who can offer us your saving grace. And so we pray that this week we would trust the risen Jesus, that he would be our joy in sorrow's tears, that he would be our strength to cast out fears, that he would be our hope in darkest night, and that he would be our broken soul's delight. Might he be all those things to us. Give us that gift, we pray, in his name. Amen.